Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. There are probably still a few people uh, filing in, because um, I guess security is for understandable reasons particularly tight this morning. Uh, a warm welcome to this session on managing new risks. I guess we're the warm-up act for uh, um, uh, the, the VEEP, um, so um, we'll do our best to... Uh, to, to, to get you going. Um, we, we want to focus, I guess there's been a lot of uh, discussion about what these so-called new risks are. And we've had the known knowns, with apologies to Secretary uh, of Defense Rumsfeld, the known unknowns, and even some of the unknown unknowns. Um, and I, I wanted to focus perhaps this morning, uh, in, a, in a more practical sense, on the managing part of the title. Uh, managing new risks, because uh, we've got four um, uh, really uh, expert people who have some great tales from the front of how the emergence of uh, new, new star terrorist threats, pandemics, reputational risks, um, and, and dangers of all kinds, small and large, um, uh, to, to, to tell some of those tales. To kick off, perhaps the latest risk is on the front page of my newspaper this morning, uh, avian flu outbreak prompts ban by EU. Um, that's probably uh, that's becoming one of the known unknowns, uh, and those things uh, uh, in their early stages are particularly scary. Let me introduce the speakers uh, one by one. From my uh, on my far right, John Coomba, sorry, uh, 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 Klaus Knerich of. Um, uh, Burkhard Knerich of the International Save the Children Alliance, I beg your pardon. Alan Buckman, uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Fleur. John Coomba, uh, Ch Chief Executive of uh, Swiss Re. Uh, and Uwe Durkin, uh, on my immediate right, the Chief Executive Officer of DHL from Belgium. So you can see there's a, a real wide spectrum of uh, people in the risk business or exposed to risk. And I'd like to start um, with John, um, um, mainly because your business is in its totality risk. And I'd like you to describe to us how the profile of your uh, risk assessment has changed in the last couple of years and what changes to your systems and processes you've had to make to reflect that. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, let me just say on the subject, oh, sorry, on the subject of um, Managing new risks, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, cooperation with government, public-private partnership, whatever you wish to call it. Um, but uh, let me go back to your, your question. The, when I first read the program and, and saw that we were talking about new risks uh, coming from the insurance industry, I said, are there new risks? Is it all not just new wine in old bottles? Uh, but I think some things have changed so much in, in size, in speed, and pervasiveness that we can genuinely call them new. Uh, now, as, as you said, other people are vulnerable to risks and try to avoid them. In insurance, we make a business out of them. Uh, so let me think about um, some of the things which we feel have changed. Uh, terrorism is mentioned in the program. Uh, from an insurance perspective, uh, the largest ever event prior to 9-11 was Hurricane Andrew, 20 billion US dollars of loss. The largest terrorist loss was the uh, terrorist bombing in London in 93, was 1 billion US dollars. Uh, the 9-11 event is 40 billion US dollars. Uh, this change in scale maybe makes it a new risk. Add to that the yet, as yet unknown possibility, and God forbid it should ever happen, of weapons of mass destruction, and you've reached a scale where the insurance industry is not equipped to cope with the problem. So we need dialogue with government, we need to find solutions with government. Epidemic is another risk. Um, we some, it's a little bit off the front pages now, but when one thinks of the devastation that AIDS has uh, produced in the fragile economies of Africa, we can see the consequences of epidemic very starkly. But take the more recent one of SARS. Here you get a pervasiveness of risk. Um, seven to 800 people died from SARS, a sad human loss. 1% of GDP was lost in Hong Kong as a result of SARS. Uh, tourism and travel industries, airline industries were affected. And you start to get an economic consequence. If it got a little bigger, you could imagine currencies and interest rates beginning to be affected. So there's an interconnectivity of risk which could eventually become very large and very difficult to handle. Again, would involve government. And if you'll permit me, I'd just like to mention two risks which I think will become entirely new. Uh, one is climate change. You will know about climate change. But we really don't know what's going to happen when the world gets two or three degrees warmer. We don't, if, you know, if we knew whose town was going to get flooded and whose crops were going to be destroyed, we might get a greater sense of urgency. 
I hope we don't get to that point, but there's risk there which needs to be managed. And demographic change. Uh, you know, we run the risk that wealth creation is going to be the province of Asia and Europe is going to become a big nursing home. Uh, and that's not a satisfactory outcome. And here again, we have risks with a, a slow fuse, but they're slow cures. And, and we need cooperation with government. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess you, you just put in a nutshell the, uh, the sort of wake-up moment that 9-11 uh, that and the other catastrophes of the last couple of years, that there, that there are certain things that are just uninsurable. And uh, the, I well understand the, the, the change role of government. We'll come back to that. Um, Uwe Durkin, your company uh, operates, or is by definition, uh, most exposed to uh, disruption, danger uh, of all kinds, all these risks that we have talked about. Um, how, does that, how has that changed the way you manage the company? Thank you, Andrew. Um, DHL, with uh, presence in more than 220 countries and territories, is, to our knowledge, the most global organization in the world. No other organization has that footprint. And the last two remaining countries, where we weren't active yet, <coughs> have been added to the map in the last uh, two years. They were Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so that obviously puts us in the firing line almost everywhere where something happens. Um, in the 40 countries that the U.S. State Department describes as the most dangerous countries of the world, we are active in every single one. Um, when the um, planes flew into the World Trade Center, we had an office. Um, fortunately, our uh, people were just done uh, doing their delivery rounds, so they escaped. They were on the bottom floor. Um, one block away from the Pentagon, where the other plane hit, there was a DHL office. The Pentagon is one major customer for us, not least because we are helping a lot in those areas of the world where nobody else is delivering. When the bomb went off in the discotheque in Bali, um, one of our managers was unfortunately uh, there and he was killed. He was there on a sponsoring project that we uh, did with the company. And um, last November, um, in uh, the, to my knowledge, first successful attack with a shoulder-fired missile on a um, civil plane uh, happened and uh, we were lucky we uh, got the plane back uh, on the ground with uh, nobody harmed. So, um, risks, we are very aware of risk and uh, our employees know about it, we manage it as well as we can. Um, I might start by saying uh, we do not send people to such areas who don't want to be there. But by the way, you would be surprised how many volunteers there are, more than we can staff, who want to have a little challenge and open our business in Iraq, for example. So we have no shortage um, of, uh, uh, of people who like uh, to help us to provide a service uh, in these circumstances. And it's a, I think, very noble and important task to do that, because how could countries in such circumstances be resurrected um, if we wouldn't start to have confidence and, and uh, build up in them? Um, now, the question that that raises from the point of view of our customers, of course, is um, the risk to the supply chain. We are supposed to keep um, perfect supply chains working for our customers under any circumstances, and they want to have immediate answers uh, from us in any case of disruption for which we have to prepare. There has been a little bit of a rethink of the generally hold, generally hold wisdom uh, in logistics um, due to these disruptive events of the last two or three years. It used to be thought that the trend was to less and less logistics centers where more and more concentrated stock locations would allow us to hold less and less stock and the marvelous transportation system in the world would always be able to shoot uh, the needed good from anywhere in these logistics centers to anywhere where it was needed. Now the rethink is that companies have come to um, accept that in order to have a safe supply chain, it is okay to build in a little more redundancy into the supply chain again. So where in the past you would have built one supply center for, let's say, all of North America, you are now more likely to maybe think of three or four so that you're closer to the action, that when one breaks down, you can work with the other and you can ensure the safety of what you're doing. What are we doing as a provider to build in more safety? Well, one is we try to build um, backup capacity uh, into our system. So I take the example of our IT system. Our IT system is based on three major IT centers uh, in three different continents of the world. 
One is in Phoenix, Arizona, one is in Kuala Lumpur, and one uh, is being finished this year in Prague. Each of those centers has two independent power grids um, accesses, has two independent um, power plants that can spring to action if the general uh, electricity supply breaks down. Um, so that is like a fourfold security in each center, and then each of the centers, each of the three, can back the whole system up. So if one of them breaks down, there's two left. Even if two of them break down, there's still one left that can run the whole world. But on a normal um, day, they just, every eight hours, the management of the IT network of DHL is passed from one of the center to the next. Um, we call it follow the sun. So that's an example of how you build capacity into your system. The other one is you have a menu of option that allows you to react when things go, go wrong. Um, now, DHL has tried to add to this uh, a menu of options by being present in all transportation modes. Um, we are in ground transportation, in air transportation, in ocean. Um, we do it in an integrated expressway, but also in the traditional forwarding cum airline or shipping line uh, way. Um, we have uh, postal systems uh, in our network. And in case of, so I take another example, the, the um, port strike uh, in the US uh, a good year ago. Um, one thing you can do is um, back up with different transportation modes. So when uh, shipping got disrupted, certain cargo, of course not everything, uh, went uh, via air and there was actually a surge in air transportation across the Pacific. Um, another um, way to do that is to try to access the same area by sea but through different ports. So I think overall, while the challenges are big and while there is a certain extra cost attached compared to an ideal situation where you don't have to care for security at all, there is still a lot of room left in the world logistics system to be further optimized, even with security in mind. And I would also say, generally, um, the disruption is, um, I think, uh, ultimately manageable. The world logistics system is enormously versatile, has so many bits and pieces that can play together. So um, I think uh, with a little adjustment uh, in uh, our um, weighing of uh, um, priorities, a little bit more security, a little bit less um, raw optimization, we can um, let the logistics world system function in the future, even in view of some uh, disruptions. Thank you very much. Um, Alan Berkman, uh, at Floor, you're managing major capital projects on behalf of a wide variety of clients all over the world and taking on uh, huge amounts of risk uh, from them, for them. Um, uh, can you describe how that looks uh, in, this, uh, in this troubled world? Yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to. Um, as you've said, one of the main parts of our business is to install capital plants for our clients. They are generally large investments that they're making in growing their businesses, and they entail a significant amount of risk of almost all types. Uh, our business, our job, our value that we add to that is to be able to assume those risks, uh, to proactively look to prevent them, and then to mitigate those that might in fact occur. I'll, I'd like to take a moment just to address two of those that I think uh, in and of themselves are not necessarily new. But I think some of the dimensions that we've heard talked about already do create new challenges in, in that regard. Uh, first is in the environmental arena. Uh, a number of the plants that we may construct, uh, once they are in operation, contain some uh, fairly hazardous and, and nasty uh, materials. Uh, they typically can come sometimes in the form of raw products, but more often than not, it's an intermediate product that's, that's created during the manufacturing process. Now, we've always had a rather extensive and thorough review of the hazardous materials in that process and designed into the process ways to cope with potential problems that might occur to prevent the release of those materials and, and harming of either the atmosphere, uh, the environment, or to, uh, to, to, to human, humans. But the, the advent of terrorism brings a whole new aspect of that. Uh, the ability for somebody to attack and to, to either uh, create a, a significantly negative impact to that process during that manufacturing phase or even during the logistics of delivery of those products puts a whole new dimension into what we have to do to, to prevent and then uh, hopefully uh, through that prevention not have to mitigate uh, if there were an incident. We have a risk process at Fleur that is proprietary that takes and looks at all of the elements of risk of a, of a project. It's a formally facilitated process 
and it's one that we have to continually update and modify based on the risks that, that we, we see uh, that, that we've got to, uh, to address. In this particular case, uh, it, it takes a fairly uh, extensive technical knowledge to come in and provide the mitigation uh, strategies that would go around preventing a terrorist attack and, and that would create a significant negative uh, event. Uh, so that's one that I, that I would mention. The other that I would mention is, again, not necessarily new, but its scope is becoming so large that it's, it's difficult to deal with, and that would be the interdiction into our, in our information systems uh, uh, that, that would control the plant or that we use as our tools to, to construct that plant. Uh, ha hacking into Internet systems and to computer systems has become in such a scale that it is something that, continue, that requires a continuous uh, approach to prevention. Uh, on a global basis, we, we have operations and facilities that we're constructing around the globe. We can get as many as 50 to 60,000 uh, attempts on a given day uh, to hack into our systems to create problems, uh, to destroy data, or to, uh, to uh, interrupt operation. And so as we set up these systems, again, part of the risk process is to look to put in secure, reliable uh, systems to protect those. And uh, again, uh, if given the fact that there could be a problem or a failure, uh, to put in business interruption and other techniques to quickly get back online and to uh, put the systems right. So those are two areas, again, not new risks in and of themselves, but because of the number of the issues we're facing today that are new issues either by, by their introduction or by their scale require a whole new look at the, uh, at the prevention side. I think that number of hacking attacks uh, per day, 50 to 60,000, uh, is truly scary. Um, uh, really shows the a, a new degree of vulnerability out of those supposedly risk-reducing IT systems. Borkhard Nerig, uh, you face, although you're a non-governmental organization, a not-for-profit, um, many of the same issues that companies face because you're in many of the, or well, perhaps by definition, in many of the most dangerous places as an organization. Um, uh, and you also have a, a worldwide brand to protect. Um, how do you go about that? Yeah, that's correct. We work in about 120 countries and uh, as a matter of principle we work in the countries which are the poorest, where work is most difficult, where children suffer most. And so for us you could say terrorism, violence shouldn't be a new risk, but it is a very new risk because in the past we were kind of neutral, we were out of the picture. If we behaved correctly, we could minimize the risk easily for us. Recent uh, attack against the Red Cross has very publicly shown that these times are over, but I can also give you examples from other countries where Save the Children had incidents with hand grenades, with bombs. So uh, non-governmental organizations are not, no longer outside the picture. This is a new risk, a completely new risk for us, which arrived, so to say, in the last two to three years. And uh, what do we do? Uh, we have uh, about 10,000 people working for us around the world, and most of them are nationals. They work in the countries uh, where they uh, uh, come from. And so the idea of closing down, evacuating, is not really a very attractive idea to us. We have to find case-by-case uh, -case solutions. Example, Afghanistan, our people were threatened. We decided they would work from home. So we closed the office and said, okay, we can live with uh, damage to the office if that's happening, but we can't live with an interruption of our work. Message here would be we need to be creative. We need to know uh, the local situation absolutely precisely and we have to react according to the local situation. This is becoming more and more a, a very large problem of uh, complexity. In times of the Cold War you had a much simpler approach where you could have some global understanding of what was going on in conflict areas. Nowadays it's very clear for us we need tailor-made solutions for each situation and our key uh, buzzword here would be information. Know what's going on, know it as early as possible and don't think twice about it. React fast before you uh, incur a risk to the life of your colleagues. Make sure uh, uh, you have done something uh, uh, to counteract. 
Second area which is uh, becoming more and more uh, difficult for us, and I hear that from the corporate sector as well, um, the behavior of what the corporates would call customers, we would call it supporters, is changing very fast. So you have uh, people uh, who supported you for years now deciding, well, they would want to do something differently. You recruit new supporters and they don't have the expectation that they support you for years. They expect to support you for a specific project for a short term uh, period of time. So it becomes much more complex to uh, uh, keep your supporters on board and the risk of large groups of supporters leaving to support something else which has become more fashionable is increasing. What do we do? Uh, again, we want to have a broad range of offers, so we want to try if uh, people want to uh, support different courses, we can uh, uh, offer these different courses. If they want to support in a different way, we can offer them uh, alternatives. And uh, 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 as a general principle, again, know what is going on, know this very early, and react on the basis of a solid long-term strategy in a very pragmatic, short-term oriented way. My final comment, uh, what we find in general, um, inequality in the world, as you know, is increasing. And as a, as a consequence of that, all kinds of risks are increasing. And therefore, I would say our organization tries to act against this risk of growing inequality, which will generate more violence, which will put more people into despair, which will uh, uh, give more people sometimes no alternative but to use violence, which uh, will create less security for all of us. We believe it's much cheaper uh, to counteract to that trend uh, in preventing a further deterioration of the, of the living conditions of people around the globe, in helping to develop countries, in helping to overcome uh, the most uh, um, uh, distra uh, distressing uh, inequalities and uh, in supporting people in, in uh, supporting themselves. So I believe this overall risk needs to be addressed differently. We should not talk so much about how we get out of conflicts. We should talk more about how do we prevent them. That is a most welcome note. Um, Borkhardt, if I could just ask a follow-up question there. As far as the NGOs co coming into the firing line is concerned, that new risk that you talked about, um, to what extent is that associated with um, the fact that NGOs and, and governments' roles have become a little bit blurred or, or, or intertwined in some of these conflict situations? I know that there's a whole issue of how, how much distance you should keep from government actors on the ground in, say, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Well, to, to, I, th I think, again, there is no general answer to that. Just to give you an a example, um, in Sri Lanka, the Norwegian government was involved in, in um, the negotiations uh, in order to end their civil war. And our Norwegian-run office in Sri Lanka uh, had hand grenades uh, thrown at them, even though the only thing which they, they had in common with the Norwegian uh, colleagues who, who helped to broker a deal was that they had a Norwegian passport. So there was no link whatsoever, but it was seen as a link and that was enough. I think what the only thing I would say which seems to be a pattern, the ethics of, and I think the Red Cross is really a, the symbol for all of us, the ethics of saying these guys are doing neutral work, they try to help people in need, and they are not part of the conflict, and we keep them out because it benefits all of us. This has broken down. And uh, if terrorists attack NGOs, I think they have a very clear message. The message is we do not want people to receive help. We do not want the present situation to be stabilized by humanitarian support. Whoever tries to stabilize this situation is our enemy and obviously uh, trying to uh, save children means trying to create stable uh, living conditions and environments for children and therefore we are seen as being on the other side. Thank you. Um, 
Well, one thing that uh, various speakers have already touched on, and I wanted to try and press a little further, was um, the question of the limits of private sector activity, both in terms of individual private sector actors and collective uh, action, uh, and how, how that intersects with uh, expectations of the role of government. John, you, you mentioned that uh, to, uh, in, in, to kick off. Um, that there are increasing expectations of government. And I guess this is the first time in these last couple of years, certainly in my memory, where we've bumped up against the sort of, we've seen the overall limit in terms of what the private sector can ensure against. And that's rather a sort of thought-provoking moment. So, so could you um, dig a little deeper on, on the question of what the expectations of government are? And maybe I could ask the other speakers to, to comment on that after you. Well, I think government expects us to address the problems uh without their involvement and certainly without turning to their checkbook. Um, although it's a little different across the world. Uh, we have in Europe, I think, been able to communicate uh, very well with government that we cannot, as an industry, uh, deal with the problems of huge financial events uh, with an unpredictable occurrence rate. Uh, it's a long been a tradition, for example, with uh, certain floods, floods in Holland, the insurance industry can't cope with on its own. There's a, a cooperation arrangement where the insurance industry takes some risk and government stands behind it. Same has come about with terrorism. And, and those dialogues have been successful. I think we, uh, we're still in a dialogue in the United States where there's a more of a tradition of saying uh, it's a self-help society rather than a government help society. And, uh, I hope we can uh, better communicate the need for some partnership to be durable. Uh, there is a partnership at the moment, Terrorism Act, but we'd like that to be a more durable partnership for these extreme events. Of course, uh, if, if in the case of floods, it, it helps if they occur in the run-up to an election campaign, as any German president <laughs> will um, testify. Um, Uwe, the, the, um, uh, I guess for DHL and companies in the supply chain there, the role of government can be uh, a facilitator, but it also can also be something that throws sand in your wheels. Um, could you describe your um, hopes and fears in that respect? Yeah. Well, while I fully agree with what John said, it's ironic that in our industry it's just the other way around. Uh, when it comes to insuring planes against terrorism these days, it's the United States who, for some mysterious reason, still guarantee that for their airlines at no cost, while in most other parts of the world, certainly in Europe and most of Asia, uh, airlines have to take out insurance against that again from the private sector. Um, but that is maybe just a, a punctual anomaly. Um, to uh, um, the question of government intervention, um, I think uh, I want to um, go much lower down to the small things one can do to improve uh, uh, the situation. Um, and uh, I think one fallacy that we often fall into, also the United Nations, also all the good work that the forum is doing, is that we think that let's say things are roughly the same way in certain parts of the developing world as they are here. I mean, the United Nations publishes statistics on the average usage of radios per household in Zimbabwe. I mean, I'm mystified where these numbers come from and how that works. I mean, in reality, uh, in many of these countries, there are not the same systems that we have. Uh, we cannot just produce wonders with money because there are no organizations there that can implement anything. Um, and I think, uh, in order to manage risks and to manage a slow but gradual improvement in those parts of the world, um, the private sector is required to help a lot. And uh, the way we react uh, to that, or we try to make a very small contribution um, from the DHL perspective, is that we do a lot of uh, corporate social responsibility work in these countries. We are always um, at the forefront when um, some uh, event strikes, for example, the, the recent uh, Iran earthquake, we were there with our planes to fly um, relief supplies in the first uh, um, days when nobody else was there. We try to cooperate with um, customs uh, um, organizations. We have a pilot project with the World Economic Forum for the um, Philippines to help uh, um, to improve the customs uh, organization there. 
And so we are trying, in small ways, to uh, replace some of the functions that uh, in other parts of the world would be natural, more naturally government functions and try to, to, um, to add up. Well, a third example would be AIDS in, in Africa. There is uh, not always very good uh, government organization that can deal with it. So at least for our own employees, we um, try to educate them on preventive measures. We um, pay for their treatment and the treatment of their family members uh, when, they, uh, when they need it. And sometimes, sadly, we also have to try to soften the blow when the family loses its, its major breadwinner. Now, again, things that in uh, Western Europe you wouldn't typically have to do as a company, but that come to you um, to help and to prepare the ground um, against the inequalities that are somehow the source of terrorism in some way, as uh, Burkhardt alluded to. Um, we try to make a contribution and sometimes be like a little bit of government in those places where the government can't do that. As far as, the, uh, as far as the downside is concerned there, Uwe, um, uh, could you just briefly comment on um, how much of a disruption you are experiencing in your daily work as a result of the extra security measures uh, taken by uh, the United States administration in particular? Yeah, it's admirable <laughs> that um, crisis events make us uh, spurt into action and try to uh, find measures to prevent, but in the security prevention um, industry, uh, there is currently also a certain tendency to overreact. And of course, it's extremely difficult to make the trade-off of how much extra hassle uh, do I go through to protect um, potentially uh, um, the extra life that is uh, in a way very difficult to, to value. However, I would say that some of the ideas that are being produced sound great on paper but have very, very expensive consequences that will touch all of us and that we should uh, think twice about. I mean, one of the discussion items at the moment is to have perfect sets of information for any piece of cargo um, that gets uh, on a plane and uh, then varies depending on who says it within hours before, half an hour before, or um, by the time the cargo gets on the plane. Um, that will be... Um, probably still the most feasible by the traditional express industry that traditionally has a full record of what is going on in its shipments anyway because it has track and trace systems, etc. It will be a lot more difficult for some more traditional transportation industries which nevertheless transport in terms of weight the great bulk of what we all consume uh, and receive. And it will um, be extremely disruptive for certain not small parts of the global logistics systems like, say, the postal system, where there, is, there just is no information about what is going on in the parcels and the letters that are being sent. Do you not feel we're in a learning process because terrorism is a relatively new risk? As you've all explained so well, risk prevention is one of the keys to, right. to mitigating risk and controlling risk. And if you ask the question, what is the sprinkler system for terrorism, we don't yet know. We're True. trying to find it, and, and the security measures seem to be the, 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 the first, the most successful step. And I agree with you. That it, I applaud the way people have responded mm -hmm. uh, to try and cope with uh, a very unwelcome threat. Burkhardt, you wanted to come in there on a specific point. Yes, I don't think that government uh, interference for us is a new risk, uh, but it's a growing one. And we are used to governments trying to influence uh, what we do, but what we haven't seen before is the dimension in which this is happening. For example, we have uh, the issue of reproductive health, which uh, the US government has made an issue, and it is an issue not when a specific project, which you would maybe want to have support from the US government for, is at stake, but it's an issue which is linked to your organization. So your project might be very different, but your organization does in other projects, financed by other resources, something which is not uh, exactly what uh, the US government expects. And uh, you are out of the game, so you don't even uh, need to apply for resources because you will not get them. So this is a trend which is deeply worrying. Um, we believe that uh, it's essential for us to work together with donor governments and with host governments, but obviously more essential for us to keep our independence and to do what children need. We have the same trend on uh, what we call the host country side, so where we run our projects, we have governments who have understood 
that uh, we deliver significant services, we bring in significant amounts of, of resources, and so they try to channel it according to their interests. And again, elections were uh, mentioned, so there is a clear stress on some of our programs in some countries uh, before elections, shouldn't we redesign the program, shouldn't we accompany the minister on the tour here and there and, and explain how marvelous the, the government is doing this. And in case we wouldn't do that, well, maybe we wouldn't get a permit next time to work in this provin province and to do that project. So this, uh, again, uh, a change in the approach of governments to the work we do, and that makes our work much more difficult and in fact there are cases already where we leave countries because the government with their interest to kind of uh, define what we do makes our work impossible. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a little uh, time check before we go further. I'm going to uh, throw it open to the floor in a few minutes' time. Uh, we're going to wrap up the session, not quite at 10.15 as billed, but somewhat earlier in order for preparations to be made for the following session. Um, and, and before we throw it open to the floor, I'd just like uh, to come to Alan again. Um, we've heard about some of the limits on collective action, collective private sector action, and some of the expectations which are by definition will only be partly met of government. Uh, and then there is another dimension of collective pressure on companies uh, to change their behavior in, in certain ways. Uh, and I guess that must impact on what you do in a, a whole variety of ways, not least the environmental one. Um, uh, how are you responding to the new uh, set of challenges and opportunities posed by pressure to, for example, to reduce emissions? Well, the, uh, we offer some technical solutions in that arena, obviously, but uh, again, you, you talk about the, the role of government. Uh, government regulations, uh, particularly if I would, re would refer to the United States over emissions uh, and in Europe, have created uh, a significant market for mitigating those, those emissions. Uh, the question, though, becomes is how do you do that in a way that has a, doesn't have an economic effect uh, in, in, in the entire market? And I guess that's one area that we've uh, spent a lot of time on, uh, looking as to how we can take a project that is to reduce emissions for, let's say, a refinery. Um, which, by definition, might have a negative return on investment. But by getting in and looking at the technology aspects of that refinery, looking at ways to possibly optimize the uh, usage of fuels, optimize the, the usage of utilities, uh, gain efficiencies in the, in the production of, of the, uh, the, the gasoline, uh, we're able to go in and put a return on investment into that uh, project where it makes it much more feasible for the owner, much more palatable, and in fact, in some cases, can even move it up on the priority list for their implementation. So that, that overall set of risks around the environment, again, with the right approach, the right technology, and the right uh, business sense, uh, can be turned into a positive opportunity. Does it worry you that um, we have the Kyoto Protocol, which, for example, the European Union is going to implement, uh, and on the other hand, the U.S. has not signed up and, and won't be, and then in that sense you have a sort of distorted market and, um, and distortions to competition. Is that something that bothers your business? I wouldn't, wouldn't say that it bothers the business, but I think we have to be uh, aware of the effects on the marketplace with respect to, to governmental decisions, because it may affect uh, how we approach that individual market. It uh, certainly affects how we look at the risks. So it's not necessary we're going to see a race to the bottom in these standards, but rather um, a, 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 a competition between systems. More than likely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw it open to the floor now. Um, there will be microphones dotted around the place that I can't see because um, I've got light in my eyes. But um, who would like to ask the first question? A gentleman in the front. Howard Kunruther from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. I found the panel most instructive and interesting, and I wanted to raise the following question to anyone on the panel with respect to some of the challenges one faces with new risks. Uh, when you have new risks, you obviously don't have a large history associated with them, uh, by definition. Uh, and you're going to find also that experts are going to disagree on the nature of the risk. 
Uh, so you're faced with the challenge of how you're going to manage them. And on top of that, as we've heard with respect to terrorism and supply chains and the computer hacking, you have a, an interdependency among these risks in the sense that it isn't only your organization, but there are others that could contaminate you in the process. So I'd like to raise the issue as to the role that you see with respect to the private sector, which clearly your own firms would have to deal with, but also how the government may come in in the context of public-private partnerships. And and obviously on top of that, uh, and this comes back to you, Andy, in terms of the media, they have the media playing up these risks, and so you have a whole element of associated with respect to how one deals with these issues in the context of trying to manage them. So it's in that context I'd like to pose the question. Well, indeed, risks are by definition news, especially when they change. Um, who would like to try and take on that question? Uwe or John? 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 I'll have a go if you yeah. like. Um, However, Both. imperfect. Uh, I think whenever you're faced with, with a new risk, uh, you can go back to classical risk theory, um, which is we have to identify risk, we have to assess how uh, important it is economically and in other ways, then we have to deal with it. Uh, root causes are important. And um, Burkhardt talked a little bit about one of the root causes of some risks when he talked about poverty or lack of prosperity to pick up the theme of the conference. We should never quite give up on that one. Uh, there are root causes which can be addressed. But nevertheless, in the immediate situation, you have to, to assess what is causing the risk, how can we prevent it, how can we mitigate it. Once you've done that, you get into diversifying it. And there we talked about uh, three supply chains instead of one supply chain. So if the risk is susceptible to diversification through your own actions, diversify it that way, and then you go to others like insurance companies. I don't think you want me to explain the principles of insurance, but... Um, uh, In three sentences. Okay, okay. Insurance is a pooling arrangement. <laughs> you put your risk into the pool, I put my risk into the pool. We then share some uncertainty, and one of us is the victim of a random event. He takes the money. The rest of us have put the money in. And to make that work, there has to be a mutuality of interest. You have to think the amount of money you're paying into the pool is fair in relation to the amount of money I'm paying into the pool. Um, I'm going to come to Uwe and then Burkhardt. Well, I can give you an example of a an, of an practical application. Um, after uh, September 11, suddenly all insurances um, pulled their cover for a third-party um, uh, terrorism risk uh, for planes. Now, we have more than 300 planes uh, flying out there, which uh, makes us one of the top 10 airlines of the world, and we had to come to a solution. For most airlines in the world, that was um, relatively easy. They went to their government because most airlines just have uh, one so-called airline operating certificate and the uh, governments in the days after September 11, one by one, um, came to the conclusion that they had to cover. In our case, it's a bit more complicated because as we uh, operate in so many parts of the world, we have more than 15 airline operating certificates under the most uh, wonderful governments. Um, which some of them were not so fast to react. And we had some very exotic cases too. Um, we had a plane leased from a company in Australia that was having a daily rotation between Belgium and Bahrain for our Middle East business. And it was hard to explain to the Australian government their interest in quickly coming in with a, um, with a coverage that they found maybe a bit more logical for their national carrier doing flights mostly in Australia. So, the way we had to act, react with this is um, several weeks of frantic activity to get all those uh, different possible public coverages in line. Um, some um, airlines, um, I think Hong Kong was a case, didn't receive any state cover and they had to immediately kick in with private cover. That was very, very expensive. I think that's one of the characteristics from business point of view. When risk is uncertain, the prices become very, very high and it's a real question mark for um, your economic model um, if you can sustain that. And in our case, we've, uh, we did actually do some days of flying in some areas uh, with taking a calculated risk ourselves without uh, um, third-party insurance cover. 
um, and uh, in the end we had it uh, organized. So I think um, as a company, when you're faced with a new risk, uh, normally it creates a lot of extra disruption in both um, uh, human resource, resources that you have to reserve to deal with the issue and in uh, price for insurance, uh, at least short term, um, for risks that are not fully understood until after a while the market people again, which I would say it now more or less uh, is. Interesting figure that uh, I found while I was preparing for this, that uh, after all the hullabaloo after, over terrorism insurance, uh, the insurance industry in the U.S. itself estimates that only one in five of their customers have taken out terrorism insurance. That was about a year ago. Burkhardt, you wanted to make a point. Well, I wanted to uh, add the point that uh, I believe the most important um, element of addressing new risks is don't run away, don't close your eyes. And if you look at the example of HIV AIDS, nowadays it's not a new risk anymore, but we know about it for more than a decade and people were neglect ne neglecting the risks even though they knew the figures, they knew what would happen, they closed their eyes, they, they were uh, turning their heads the other way and um, I think even when in some countries HIV AIDS took a very dramatic dimension, um, heads of states, uh, heads of government still closed their eyes and didn't want to see it. So I think that is really a challenge and I believe that's a challenge for each leader uh, uh, towards a new risk. I would believe that you have a few ingredients which help you to deal with new risks. My first one would be don't close your eyes. My second one would be have a long-term strategy so you know where you're going and have a, a short-term strategy you know how to get there and then be flexible with the short-term strategy, take the risk seriously, look at what it means for you, look what the root causes of the risks are, look at how much you can influence that and then uh, find the appropriate way to react to that. Again, I would believe information is absolutely key and uh, in general um, placing responsibility where the decisions have to be taken, not over centralizing decision making, uh, place responsibility to your colleagues and give them support is a good approach for short term unforeseeable risk which, which arise. Thank you. Alan. It's an interesting question because if you get into the risk areas where you don't have the ability to, through historical data, to assess the risk properly or to uh, gauge the impact of it, it, it seems to me that those are cases where, where you have that responsibility for mitigating, uh, preventing or mitigating that risk, uh, that that may in fact drive, because of some of the secondary risks that would be involved, uh, some of the overreaction uh, uh, things that we've talked about earlier, uh, the overreaction to go beyond what may be considered prudent or normal. Uh, and some of those secondary risks are in fact media coverage, uh, reputational loss, uh, legal action, uh, and, uh, you know, at the, the risk of being a bit provocative, we talked about government uh, issues, but that whole issue of legal reaction uh, after a risk event is a serious issue, uh, particularly if you take uh, one that might occur in the United States and the, the need for tort reform there. So maybe a plug for our next speaker in the next event is to, uh, to move into that arena. You want him to put tort reform in the election manifesto? Well, I think he's already got it on his agenda. Okay. <laughs> um, any more? Next question. Any more questions? Yes, madam. Thank you. I'm, I'm Bridget Hazard from the London School of Economics. Um, some of the risks that you discussed as new, actually the new thing that struck me about them was their scale. Um, some of them are new risks with new technologies. Your, your hacking comes in there. Climate change definitely comes there. Some of them aren't so new. Uh, sadly, um, SARS has its predecessors, uh, transnational plagues in the past, and very sadly, wars are not new either. Um, so to, here's a more upbeat note, that were also new opportunities um, for managing risk. We have uh, much more information available than we used to. It's very speedy, it's also transnational. And we have can exchange information about mitigating risks, about analyzing what has gone wrong, what might go wrong, exchanging information. Now, you've talked a little bit about the role of government there, but I'm just wondering what sorts of conditions and other institutions you might look to that might actually help facilitate managing new and old risks on a very large scale. Who would like to? Uh, I'm going to ask, I, I'm going to, uh, 
pose a little supplementary to that, which is possibly uh, the same question. Um, uh, which of you are thinking about new products in this area? Uh, John. Well, I think it's a very good question, and I, I agree with what you said. When we're not helpless when it comes to risk. We can do things, and there are upsides. Uh, and by the way, when you're also no risk is totally new. Uh, there are simulations you can do from similar risks. There are ways you can model it and, and construct theories around what happens. Um, yeah, we can, uh, we can be inspirational. We can be creative. We can use technology to try and address uh, problems of risk. I think uh, Alan would know more about that than I, but to, to address environmental opportunities. I mean, for me, climate change is, is really comes down to renewable energy and reducing carbon emissions. And you, you can... You can be creative, and, and the industry is, and, lots of, and I think we'll find solutions to those problems. I think um, to pick another one, um, I mentioned demographic change. Uh, you can just say, oh, we're all going to get old, what a shame. Or you can say that we're going to have another career when we reach age 60, and we're going to you know, keep working and start to um, uh, give some more energy into society and be a little bit more creative. So we should just keep looking for new things and, and solve problems ourselves. And has Swiss Re offered a new um, protection against flood damage in the year 3000? Uh, working on it, Andrew, working, working on it. On it. <laughs> <laughs> Uwe. Well, I agree very much with the general outlook that while maybe the scale has changed, uh, a lot um, has in a way always been there. Um, what we have again and again done at DHL, which worked, is to rely on our local people on the ground to have a much better feeling for how big the risk really is and what can be done than anybody with the wisest preventive strategy kind of thought out at headquarters. Now, I'll give an example or two. We had a flood in Indonesia some years ago. Um, some, of, uh, some islands to which we used to deliver regularly were, were cut off. Um, some of our people, um, or some villages on those islands, some of our people got out their rubber boats, their private rubber boats, and rode out there, both with the shipments, but of course also with the relief supplies just to help. This is something you can't ask people to do, but when they do it voluntarily, of course, we, we um, help them, we support them in that. Another example is uh, SARS, which, uh, let's say, in its immediacy uh, was, and in its panic that was somehow amplified by the media, was uh, maybe in that sense a little bit new. Again, our people locally, rather than stay home, as many people in Hong Kong did, decided to take an active uh, state. They dressed up, well, you, you would think they were like a chemical a cleanup unit after a chemical incident, um, did their job. Um, whenever they entered a, a house, they had uh, tissues with them. They wiped every button they touched. They wiped every envelope they handed over to the customer. And they actually even made a business opportunity out of it. They went to all the uh, different conferences that had been canceled and convinced the organizers to um, send the documents uh, by mail. And actually, we had a surge in document traffic in Hong Kong during that uh, uh, epidemic. So our um, uh, experience is um, when something unexpected strikes in a faraway place, um, ask the locals and let them uh, take uh, the spiritual lead of how to react. And it has been proven in our history again and again that they take a very courageous position. And I'm totally with Borkhardt. Don't hide. The world is a risky place, but in a way, if you look at history, we, we are probably better equipped to manage risk these days than we ever were before. Alan, is it something that your, your company uh, does to make the, sort of the risk management or the risk element of what you're doing uh, as a product uh, uh, more explicit? I, I think uh, in its uh, entirety, uh, we advertise that that is our business and that is managing risk. So I think as an overall uh, we do see that as something that, that is, it is a market service for us. But it can get down to be more specific. And I, back to the question, I do believe that we do have a number of things at our disposal today that, are, that are, uh, we may not have had in the past. I think some of the sophistication of, uh, of systems, the ability to do simulations on a, on a, on a grand scale, the ability to optimize um, uh, uh, solutions and to look for ways uh, through communication systems to quickly react uh, are there today that we didn't have in the past. So I think there's a number of ways that you can either develop new approaches to it. In some cases, those are market approaches. In some cases, they're just uh, uh, plain mitigation. Does anybody want to add a comment on the, the issue that uh, the previous questioner raised about uh, interdependencies uh, between, uh, between companies? It seems to me that quite a lot of the sort of business of managing risk uh, is when companies are exposed to risk themselves, but they, they, they cannot control them 
uh, individually. They depend on others, on working together with others. Uh, have you got any tales from the front of, of that kind that, 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 that would illuminate? Burkhardt. Obviously, my examples are slightly different from the, the company's examples, but the classic situation for us is the work in emergencies. Nowadays, most major emergencies are, or the response to them, is uh, organized in a very professional, very uh, efficient way. And you cannot go into any of these situations, crisis situations, dangerous situations, situations where you have to deliver fast without being sure that you do that in uh, the environment which is defined by everybody who is working there. And that has uh, led to quite some changes in the way how emergencies are approached nowadays. While a few years ago everybody would rush and do their thing, quite a few actors won't even get into the situation anymore because the community has agreed that you have to be professional, that you know what you do, that you have to cooperate, and that you do your work in the framework which the overall community has set. So I see that as a real positive approach which helps us not to prevent or re uh, reduce risks but to cope with the situation as it arises much more professionally and for the benefit of everybody who is involved. Thank you. We're uh, running out of time uh, for the, uh, so that we can clear the decks for the next session. Um, perhaps I could just ask Uwe to make a very brief comment on that. Well, one example for uh, companies working together in difficult situations is the disaster relief network that the World Economic Forum has put together. A lot of construction companies, transportation companies, and aid organizations of all kinds are organized in it. And one recent activity was um, triggered by the earthquake in Bam, um, where uh, within uh, 24 hours the disaster relief network was there and a combination of uh, Red Cross relief goods and a lot of other aid agencies and some DHL planes brought uh, the goods to BAM. Very interesting challenges. An airport that receives usually three narrow body flights per week suddenly had to cope with an influx of wide body planes. You know, if you want to get a pallet out of a wide body plane, it's like eight meters above the ground. So uh, we had to fly in the handling equipment first and the jeeps for the Red Cross people so that they could move around, stuff like that. But that is a cooperative effort of uh, companies and organizations from all kinds of trades. It's always unexpected what happens. It's uh, um, very challenging, it's great fun, and I think it's an example of how, uh, again, in our world, with the information we have and the capability to take preventive measures, we can be much better prepared than we ever were before to deal with disasters when they strike. Thank you very much. I think what I take away from this discussion is that in contrast to say two years ago where everybody was paralyzed and rooted to the spot at the uh, sight of new types of risks and what are we going to do, uh, hair was being torn out. We've now f heard a lot of examples of how companies have learned to cope and to handle it as part of their normal way of doing business. So I'm really grateful to our four panelists for uh, providing some really illuminating and thrilling uh, tales from their business um, and I hope that's uh, illuminated you it for you as well. Thank you very much indeed and um, let's make way for the next session.